afternoon, everybody. This is Bonnie Vandermulen, Training Coordinator for Wisconsin Facets. On behalf of our entire Wisconsin Facets staff, I'd like to thank you for joining us today. Our webinar today is entitled Transition Ready, Bridging the Gap, Transition from Pediatric to Adult Health Care. We are delighted today that our presenters are with us. Tim Markle is a curriculum developer and speaker for the statewide youth health transition initiative out of our Wasement Center. He also is a parent of an adult 23 year old on the autism spectrum and continues to work on transitioning. We are pleased to let you know that uh, Tim's son Hunter will be joining us today. So Tim and Hunter, please take it away. Thank you so much, Bonnie. It is so good to be here today. So excited to talk. Healthcare transition again with Hunter. We've done this a few times. We did this a couple times in February. Yeah, twice in February to be in fact. So it was twice? Yep, yeah, twice in February, closer to the end of February. This is the first time we've done it in March, but That's it's true. the opening of March. We gotta wait and see how much more of these we have to go through. <laughs> so we'll see. So we wanna talk to you today about healthcare transition. Um, Bonnie already introduced me and my and Hunter. Do you want to say anything else about yourself? No, I think we pretty much have done that enough. All right. Well, first of all, I want to tell you that we don't come here alone. We are surrounded by a group of partners of the Children and Youth with Special Health Care Needs Network in Wisconsin. They include people such as Parent to Parent that connects trained support parents with parents who just want to talk to somebody else who has a child with a special health care need. Um, along with Family Voices of Wisconsin, a wonderful parent advocacy organization. Well, Badger is a statewide resource center. ABC for Health works with us on insurance issues. Um, and then we have our two national performance measures, um, Medical Home, which is basically partnering with your child's doctor for the best care possible, and Healthcare Transition Wisconsin, which is one of the places that support me. In addition, our main partners are the five regional centers throughout Wisconsin. So hopefully you know what your regional center is and you know how to reach out to them for support um, because we do have them spread throughout Wisconsin. If you have trouble finding yours, just locate your county and you'll be able to know which regional center that you should call for the best and local list type hmm, information possible. Yeah. All right, so let's talk Health Transition Wisconsin. We are a statewide initiative uh, we go a lot by the initials Youth Health Transition Initiative, also known as YETI. So do you want to tell them about the YETI? Pretty much, if you keep track of the YETI, my dad says there will be a prize. There will be no prize. There's no prize. There, there's no prize. No. Well, other than the knowledge you will be able to share with others once we are done with this. All right, so keep track of the YETIs. Correct. Oh, and I ch just so you know, I changed the presentation slightly from last time. so you don't know the number of Yetis either. Oh, joy. So what do we do? We are here to ensure that high quality, developmentally appropriate healthcare services are available in an uninterrupted manner as a person moves from adolescence to adulthood. Basically moving from pediatric adolescent care into the world of adult care. And the issue is that this is sometimes a transition that's overlooked. And so we want to try to help parents and families and youth prepare for that transition. Because of that, we say that transition starts in early adolescence. And so transitioning can occur from early adolescence through 20, 25 years old, depending on the provider, depending on the person, depending on the family. There's a lot of factors involved in it. But at some point during that transitioning process, there's going to be an actual transfer of care where the medical care is moved from the youth, now a young adult, um, sometime between 18 and 22 years, they're gonna move that care from whoever saw them before they are 18 to the adult care doctor after 18 or to the adult system of care. And so we have some youth that already see family practitioners or internists and, and they not, aren't necessarily changing their doctor, but they're changing their system. Because the way that, that pediatric and youth and adolescents are seen, it changes when we become adults. And so we want families and youth to be prepared for that. What else do we do? 
Well, we also, besides doing presentations like this, we support healthcare providers and organizations in moving their transition efforts forward. We have a monthly learning community, a wonderful website, as well as outreach, and then we do training such as this. And if we're ever allowed to leave the house, we'll be doing exhibits and handing out all the stuff that we bought pre-COVID that is now gathering dust. Hopefully in April. Oh, hopefully. Hopefully. That'd be, that'd be great. Maybe late May. Yeah. It's, it's hopeful. We're hopeful. Yep. So today we're going to go and talk about what is healthcare transition anyway, introduce a readiness assessment. Hunter's going to talk a lot about the eight tools that we have for healthcare transition. Um, and then hopefully we'll have time to talk about ways and answer questions about advocating for helping youth advocate for their own health. Um, so before we get going, just a little bit more about Hunter and me. Um, so Hunter, do you remember when this picture was taken? That was taken when we were up in Door County for my grandparents' 50th anniversary. Oh, well done. Absolutely correct. It was their 50th. It might have been their 51st. And you were tugging at me to go out onto that rock. And no, it, other way around. No. Other way around. So, do you remember how you managed to get out onto that rock? Through sheer willpower of saying that the water won't eat me alive. That is very true. And how else do you remember? Uh, also, just simply knowing that you're next to me, knowing that that water wasn't as deep as I first thought, and if I did get wet, we had a good way of warming me up. Yes, all those things, absolutely true. And did we start with just tossing you onto that rock? No, it started out as a slow pace and everything of just yeah. going from rock able to stand on to next one to next one till we're out on that one, which you went up and have stated that it has now been absorbed by said lake. <laughs> it is, it is now completely underwater. Um, so there's no way I get you out of there at this point no nope. but we you 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 called it absolutely correct is we didn't just start out on that rock no. is we had a process so we walked around the rock we got used to the rock we got used to the water mm -hmm. um we took small steps toward the rock you knew i was going to be with you the whole time so you always had that support yep and we just gradually moved it until you were able to make it out on that relatively small rock relatively close to the water yeah this kind of sounds a lot like transition and everything for young adults into being able to do their own medical and personal lives. Yeah, you don't just throw them into the rock. No. You gotta take them step by step. Right. It's a mountain, not a molehill. There you go. And we're gonna and you climb it together. Yeah. And so what we're talking about is that process of changing from the adolescent or pediatric model of care to the adult model of care. Oh yeah, Got Transition. It's a good website and everything that people should use to hand out to get to. Got Transition is like a national partner of ours, and they are all about helping families and providers to to learn about transition. So who needs to think about transition? Families, teenagers, healthcare providers themselves, so they have the proper way of introducing transition and everything. Insurance companies should also start teaching mm -hmm. their yeah, people underneath should, their umbrella to them. help yeah. out as well, because right. at this point in time, we should just help each other thanks to this pandemic world we currently are in. And so just a few, you know, maybe just a few teenagers need to think about this. No, a lot more than just a handful. I'm more thinking of an entire high school science group of teenagers. So pretty much anybody turning 18. Pretty much anybody turning 18 and up. And why is it more important if a student has a disability or health care need? It's more important because they wouldn't fully understand how to do transition alone. They would need a rather large support group and way of understanding it for their own brain and everything because Despite me being on the spectrum, I know there are people on the spectrum more mentally capable than me, and then there are those that aren't, and they might need more personalized help than I do. 
So it's not going to be transition is one of those things to transition to healthcare is one of those things that just sort of happens that you all of a sudden understand it all. No. Is it something that can be taught? Yes. It's kind of a teaching moment, but the teachers, instead of in a classroom, are up and out and about being paid through federal grants or state grants to do <laughs> these things. Hopefully, hopefully not. Hopefully it's more the parents and the families learning together. That is my transition. Point. Don't rely, don't point. rely on me. No, oh you guys gosh. are the first frontline teachers yeah. and everything to teach said parents to be secondary. I'd rather have you teaching them. You really think so? Absolutely. We're going to get there. So yes, it is more important if somebody has a disability that they have that continual care. That when they when they transfer systems, that there's no drop off. Is there some kids who are medically complex who need to continually see their doctor, continually see the hospital? Well, mm -hmm. what happens if they've always been to a children's hospital and then they turn 18 and maybe that hospital rule is that there's no one over 18 and all of a sudden they're in a new hospital? That can be really scary for some kids. And so that whole sense of continuity of care, preparing for the changes that take place after 18. But first, let's talk a little bit about why is health so important? Why does health matter? We've got the transition from school to maybe work or education. That's a big one. That matters. Maybe transition to, to living different places. Um, you know, that's a big one. Why is health so important? Health is so important because it's one of the things we actually have some form of control over. Mm -hmm in a way that if our health impacts our independence, we know where to go, who to contact, what to do about this slight or major decrease in our personal independence. It also can help in our daily lives because, again, it's one of the few minor things we have good control over no matter what the system does or changes. We still have good medical professionals, we still have the surgeons, we still have the doctors, we still have the therapists, we have the groundworks of healthcare to help us out in our daily lives. So we need, how, need to know how to find them right. and how to get there. Mm -hmm. And so knowing what your insurance covers, who you can go see with your insurance and how to access that is really important. Correct. Who did that for most of your life? That would be you, mom, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, that'd, that'd be us, is you didn't have to worry at all about who your doctors were or what they were covered. No. Because we took care of all of that for you. Yeah. And so it's something then you need to be taught and you need to learn to do for yourself, which is what we've been working on. Yep, still learning to do so. Absolutely. But you're absolutely right, is that the healthier we are, the more independent we are. Mm -hmm. The healthier we are, the more success we're going to have in our everyday life. We feel better. We have more energy. We enjoy life more. Yep. And so knowing how to take care of our health and who helps us to take care of our health is really important. Yep, because it opens the door to secondary education and to specific areas of working depending on your health and everything. It would. Now, you went to Madison Area Technical College for a while. Mm -hmm. Did you learn anything about there, how they can help support your health care? Yeah, the Disability Resource Center is an amazing tool for people on the spectrum or just have generalized learning disabilities, but aren't technically on the autism spectrum mm -hmm. disorder list or anything like that. They have amazing tools. Their teachers are brilliant in what they understand. And most of the subjects that I took are easy to pick up and just work. So outside of the Disability Research, uh, Re uh, Disability Resource Center mm -hmm. uh, or services, was there any other place that you they also were connected? They also have a counseling service, to my knowledge, though I never really got in contact with said people. But they also have a lot of good clubs that assist in learning or just on general places to go and have fun and make friends. It's a very more open environment to learning, but once you enter the classroom, you get down to work on your education. But once you leave that classroom, it is just all 
open, fun students talking with other students about their courses, helping each other out. It's perfect environment for those who are like me on the spectrum, but aren't too incapable of mm -hmm. understanding what is going on around them are able to pick up minor or major social cues. Cool. So you got the Disability Resource Center, you got the Counseling Center that you found out about, and there was also a Health Center yep. that you could also go to. So you learned that there was a lot of different supports, and who was supposed to call and, and do all that? Me. Yeah, one of the big things that changed is the fact that you were in charge of letting people know about your disability. Is mm -hmm. You didn't have this team automatically around you. You had to reach out and find those supports, and that's a little bit different when people go to college. Yeah. And also in working, is you you held a job for a while, um, yeah. especially pre-COVID. Um, so how did you talk to your employers about your disability? Well, we didn't learn about my disability until I was 20, first off. You were diagnosed, you were officially diagnosed at 20, correct? Yep. So my first job as a dietitian's aide was more of just trying to understand work and getting a proper income, but mm -hmm. we had to, well, I had to leave that job due to medical reasons of the industrial dishwasher steam just started affecting my lungs in a negative way. And I don't think I called your supervisor or your employer and talked to them about that at all. No, nope, I informed them of it when I discovered it and I had to take an inhaler, but my supervisor was like, look, we have an opening over at housekeeping. I know the current supervisor. Do you want to become a housekeeper? And I was open to that. And that worked for two years, yeah. two and a half years of working at the um, place I was working at. I am trying my best not to say the place that I previously worked at due to a agreement disclosure and everything. I am not legally able to say so. Good job. Um, and thanks for doing what your ex-employer asked you to do. Yeah, I can't remember what the actual paperwork was yeah. called. I am sorry. It doesn't matter anymore, does it? No. No. So basically, this whole transition thing is a process. Yep. All of life is a process of learning. Yep. And that includes our health. So what happened at age 16 that um, most people find really important? The ability to actually own and drive a car the ability to drive a car, that's a lot of people look forward to that. Did you look forward to that? Oh, I did, but it took me three tries to finally get my license. So it took you a little while. It wasn't yeah. just a matter of sit in the car, sit behind the wheel, get it done, boom. Nope. There was some more extra steps involved in that. Yep. And I remember at one point you told me that you didn't even want your license until you felt comfortable yep. um, behind the car. And I think that's really important is that there were times where I wondered whether you would be able to drive. And now I have my own personal car and can drive pretty much almost anywhere thanks to Google Maps. Your good friend Google Maps. Yes. And then at age 18. Voting. Yay, politics. Okay, and then at 21. Time to buy and drink alcohol responsibly. There you go, responsibly and legally. So these are all milestones that yep. people look at in their life. And for some kids with disabilities, they may not look at all of those, but we really hope that at age 18, they take that responsibility to vote. Yeah, I think that's very important and part of being a responsible adult. Very much so. All these things have to do with the fact that at one day, it seems you're this kid, you're this adolescent, you're, you suddenly become this adult. Yay. Yeah, and you start adulting and you start adulthood. And it comes with a lot of really cool stuff, but it also comes with a lot of responsibilities. Yep. And health is one of them. Yep. Another is budgeting. Yes, and budgeting. And so the way we like to think about it, going back to our rocks in Door County, is that what can we do to help kiddos that are 12 to 14 or 15 to 17, 18 and up to help them? transition their healthcare successfully. 
So they understand the system. They have the skills that they need to manage their own healthcare. So let's talk about some of those. One of the things we like to talk about is a readiness assessment. Do you remember taking any assessments? Outside of schooling, no. No. So assessments in schooling, what do you think they were for? Math, English, history. All right, so sciences. different assessments in there. And what was the reason for them? To make sure you grasp the subject matter. To make sure you grasp the subject matter, absolutely. And then, so it, it, it helped you grasp, see if you grasp the subject matter, maybe pointed out areas where you needed to learn a little bit more, but also show where your strengths were, things that you had already done, that yep. you already knew about. And so the transition readiness assessment is we like to use the ones from Got Transition. They have a number of the ones out there. They are connected also to transition assessments that are diagnosis specific. Um, they also have them there for in individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. But all of them at the core are trying to look at what do I already know and what do I need to learn? So important questions, like I can explain my health needs to others. Yeah, I can do that. You've learned how to do that. You've learned actually how to talk about your autism too. Yep, and my anxiety and depression. Yeah, exactly. Um, do you know how to ask questions when you don't understand what the doctor says, or do you just nod yeah. your head and hope for the best? Most of the times I do understand what my doctor says, and I do ask questions about some stuff, but most of the time it's more of like, okay, can you repeat, but in a more English-based learning, because I don't understand that long, complicated medical word you just used. And right there is self-advocacy. Right there is being able to let the doctor know, whoa, 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 slow down. I didn't understand it. Could you repeat it in plain English? Now, in the past, the appointments would be, you'd probably look at me. Yep. And then I would have to determine whether you understood or not and then ask the doctor or I just explained it to you at home. And But I don't want to go to your doctor's office with you anymore. Nope. And so these are just all ways to figure out what you might be able to improve your skills on. Yep. and where your skills might be able to improve. And so we like giving this to youth and also parents and then comparing them. But we also greatly encourage the physician's office to use this to help their parents starting at about, help their parents, help the youth at about age 12 to gradually learn these skills before they lose what is usually a really comfortable environment with their doctor so that they have the skills when they move to their next doctor or move into the adult system. And it looks if you like um, school nurses and everything in middle school and high school should also have these on hand as well. That's a great idea to help them in school, maybe as part of the individualized education plan. Yeah. That they could actually do some healthcare goals as well and the school nurse could help them with that. Right. It's a great idea. Yeah. Not even one of mine. I like it. Um, so they do have it available in English and in Spanish, and we recommend that you would check that out. Just want to give you a brief timeline to sort of put transition into um, context of life. And so there are rules in Wisconsin that at the age of 12, you can consent to some treatments and some therapies um, without parents um, knowing about it. And so that some parents get tripped up because they start to lose access to like some of the mental health records. And you have to make sure that if you want to have access that your youth has signed a release of information to give you the right to access that. With schools at age 14, they'll start the post-secondary transition plan known as the PTP, and this has to continue throughout high school. At 17 and a half months, is if you are looking at continuing any public benefits or learning more about the adult system, that's when the Aging and Disability Resource Center comes into play, the ADRC. Every county has an ADRC and they are there to help this transition into adulthood. If you have a youth that you need to consider guardianship for, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that later, um, you need to have that planned out in advance so that um, there's not a gap, if, especially if there is a, an issue of care and of safety. And so guardianship is not one of those things that's just going to be accomplished overnight. Now, there's alternatives to guardianship. 
um, such as supported decision making. Supported decision making can also be used with guardianship, um, but there's powers of attorney, there's release of information, which is what we have with Hunter. Yep. Um, and then all males at this point, 17 and 17 and 11 months, have to go for that selective service to be registered. Um, okay. If you want Social Security income, if your youth is receiving Social Security and that you you think they qualify to continue, that needs to be taken. It's not going to be automatically transferred over. Is you need to contact the ADRC and take those steps. And then the big idea about supported decision making is who is it that makes the decisions? Who is the main decision maker after the age of 18? And we hope that it is the youth, young adult, as much as possible. So then how does the timeline for healthcare transition look like? Well, what we ask doctors offices to do and what we talk to parents and youth about is that starting around age 12, they should be aware of and every doctor's office should have a policy about how are we going to transition our youth. And so age 12 is talking about the fact that, hey, this transition is going to happen in a few years. Um, what can we do about it? Starting that planning around age 14, using the assessment, going over the skills that need to be built, um, continuing with that skill building at 18, at 16, and then maybe transitioning at 18. Now, again, sometimes, and with some specialists, it doesn't automatically happen at 18. Is This transitioning could happen, but we hope that somewhere in there, there's a transfer of care, um, usually especially with the primary care doctor. Some of the specialists may need to be part of the youth's um, support team for a while more. And then hopefully the youth, the young adult gets integrated into the adult care, they're supported, and they are successful in managing their own care. So Ag Health Transition Wisconsin, the Youth Health Transition um, Initiative, Yeti, we have come up with some tools to help you and your youth and your students to be able to make this transition to adult health care. Or yourself. Or yourself. That's right. If you're youth listening to this. Yeah, good job. Um, and so let's talk a little bit about these tools. So Hunter, first thing, adult providers. How did you find your adult providers? Boo you. <laughs> there, do you remember the, the back story, so to speak, to that? Pretty much you wanted to have my pediatrician just sit in with me alone in the room. That pediatrician was just like, why? Yeah. And then you came and asked me if it was okay, and I just simply repeated what the pediatrician said and just asked why. So at that point, I realized that I was doing a pretty poor job of transition planning with you. Oh, you betcha. And that the pediatrician didn't understand transition planning either. Nope. And so one of the important things is to help you as the youth to have a relationship with the doctor. Because for years, you go to the doctor, who does the doctor talk to when you were younger? You, me, and, or mom, or my mom, on which you two decided to take me to my appointment. And as you started to get older, we'd still be in there with you. And a lot of times the doctor still talked directly to us yep. instead of talking to you. So it still felt more like it was my doctor yep. than your doctor. Um, I remember a lot of those um, young, you know, 12, 13 years old, you know, we go to the doctor together and the doctor may talk to you, but any answers before you answered them, you always looked at me. Yep. You know, how are you feeling, Hunter? And you look at me and say, I don't know how you feel, Hunter. Tell the doctor how you feel. And so learning that you are in charge of your health care and that that is your doctor is really important. That's where that time alone, starting to build that time alone up so that you understand that that's your doctor. So I was very disappointed in the pediatrician. So what did we do? Uh, pretty much jumped dip from said pediatrician and went over to your adult provider. That's right. I loved my adult provider. So I introduced him to you. So yeah, tell us a little bit about your adult provider. What do you like about him? What, what does his team do well that you like? The fact that they keep everything down to earth and don't drown you in medical terms the length of Louisiana. Uh, the fact that you can easily joke with them and they always have a smile on their face, even though they are wearing a mask, you can easily mm -hmm. tell they are still smiling. Um, the fact that they care about their patients' health and actually ask the right questions depending on the situation you are in for visiting them. That's pretty much about it. So you really like them? Oh, I freaking like them to death. 
That's awesome. And let's talk a little bit. So the other ways that people find other adult providers is they talk to other parents yep. that have used with special health care needs. Um, they may be able to call the, um, the company that holds their insurance and say, okay, do you have any providers that specialize in children with special health care needs? Um, talk to them beforehand about, okay, my child sees this, this child specialist. Um, for like, let's say breathing, is there an adult specialist that they're going to need to start to go see? And can we meet them beforehand? And so trying to set those things, those meetings up beforehand mm -hmm. um, by talking to the insurance companies, by talking to your own doctor, um, you know, maybe that's the first person you ask is if you know that you're going to have to change doctors, you know, do you have somebody that you would recommend that would be good for, for you um, yeah. as, as an adult? It's always kind of it really is all about who you know and everything and how connected you are, how big and wide mm -hmm. your circle of friends and contacts are beyond just simple co-workers and people you might just meet out on the street once or twice just to hang out and everything. Yeah, so that whole circle of support. Yep. And who are your supporters? And that includes supporters um, who help you make decisions. Um, do you know how many decisions, um, big decisions in my life I make all on my own? Um, more than I do. Yeah, and that answer would be none. Um, so probably not. You have to make better together than I do, Connie. Oh, no, well, that's debatable. But when it comes to making decisions, I don't know everything. And so I'm always pulling other people in to help me understand things better. Yeah. When I buy a car, I talk to your grandpa. Um, if I'm going to do, you know, something new online, I'd probably talk to, you know, your uncle. Um, so there's always people that I reach out to. Which uncle? Jamie. Okay. To help make decisions. Um, but the goal is, is for you to be the final decision maker. So I can support you in those decisions. So those people give me input and they can help me make the decision. But I'm an adult, right? Mm -hmm. So whose responsibility is that decision? You at the end of the day. At the end of the day, it's my decision. Yep. And so helping you learn how to make those decisions has also been part of the journey in mm -hmm. healthcare. Um, like I think of the time where I taught you so well that you made decisions that I had no idea about. Ah, yes, the dietitian. Tell us a little bit about the dietitian. So I pretty much was asking my medical provider, my general physician and everything about gaining weight healthily and eating better foods and everything and they recommended a dietitian. I did not tell my parents about this decision and they caught me when I was leaving the house to visit said dietitian and they were pretty much like why are you seeing a dietitian so I explained and that's the just of how I have a dietitian on my medical team. And that was a huge step because I remember in your middle teenage years, just getting you to talk on the phone, just getting you to talk to anybody uh, was I a struggle. don't like talking over the phone. Yeah, so we wanted to try to encourage you to make your own appointments. Yeah. And this was back pre-COVID, COVID, pre my chart days. And so we would get off the phone and we would, um, first I would have you listen as yeah. I made your appointment as I talked to the doctors. And then gradually we would teach you what you needed to say, what you needed to be prepared to say. Yeah. Sometimes we practiced before we made the call. Yep. And then eventually you were able to start to make your own appointments. And then eventually you were making appointments without even telling me you're making appointments. And then I discovered my chart. Then you discovered my chart. So how did my chart change the way you do your healthcare? Oh, my chart is a godsend to those with disabilities and everything that don't like going through phone contacts and everything in a way that you can easily just set up an appointment for a specific date and see if your medical provider is available that day. And they can easily send you phone text reminders about said meetup with said appointment and everything with your medical provider. You can easily bill, pay your copay online, or even pay for minor interactions and everything for lab work, a basic 
surgery, anything of the sorts that require that. Well, wait, you have insurance. Why are you paying for anything? You mean even if you have insurance, you still have to pay for stuff? Well, medical insurance is more of a broad umbrella mm. that has specific amounts to how much they are willing to pay and how much they have available. So do you remember what some of the important things about insurance are that you needed to learn where the paying of it is concerned? Copay. Co so you had to learn about what a copay was. Yeah. Um, another one was a deductible, correct? Yes. Is that this might be subject to the deductible. Yeah. There's a, a portion that you have to pay before the full insurance kicks in. Uh, what medical providers are available through said health insurance. Very important whether the doctor is in network or out of network. Yep. Believe it or not, your supposedly neurotypical sister mm -hmm. cost us more money than you because she did not learn the in network, out of network doctor well enough, went to an out of network doctor for a checkup and cost hundreds of dollars. Yep. Yep. So I again not perfect in transitioning my kiddos, but I'm trying yeah. to. So it seems like you've learned all those things pretty well. Yep. Mostly. Mostly. Still have yet to get an insurance card properly because you just haven't ordered one yet. I have. It's on its way. Oh, thank God. And whose responsibility was it to keep track of the original insurance card? Me, but somehow I managed to lose it. Right. And it has been lost since 2019. I know, it's been lost for a, a little while. But do you know what's on that health insurance card? The on the on-call nurse. Okay, so the, that's really important because we don't always get sick between 8 and 5 no. during the day. No. Is sometimes we, we don't feel well at 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock at night. Or even at 5 o'clock in the morning. And everything. Yeah, 5 in the morning. So knowing that there's a nurse on call, that you can talk to is really important and that information is on your insurance card. Yep. Um, then there's just the general 911 number on there as well. Mm -hmm. Yep. So what to do for emergencies? Um, I mean, no, that's not on the house insurance. That's general ID and everything. Um, those are the only two major okay. things that come to my mind. And the other thing that we've talked about with the health insurance card is that's also, I had to do this the other day is that's also your, your health provider number that you can call and say, hey, my doctor recommends that I'm supposed to do this. Is it covered? Oh. Is it going to be paid for by insurance? So that customer service number is on there as well hmm. to make sure whether what you want to have done is covered or not. Interesting. So I'll give you that as soon as it, as soon as it arrives. Um, emergency contacts. Why is that important? because you always might not have your health insurance card on hand. You may not. And so if something would happen to you, you have to let people know who to contact in case of an emergency. Yep. Do you have that in like in your wallet or in your phone? Or Mostly in my phone. In your phone. And that's where most youth are carrying around their emergency contact information because most of them carry around their phone. I am not one of those youths. That is true. I am slowly building up to being one of those youths. That is true. But we teach how to, and the instructions are on our, our website. It's a, they're there about how to enter it into an iPhone or an Android, about how to put your emergency contacts in there. Don't forget about Samsung, Google phones now. Shh. Don't talk about them. Fine. Okay, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, so that is emergency contacts, appointments we've talked about. Yeah. You are very fortunate that you don't have any medications. Well, technically, I don't have medications, but I do take vitamins. Oh, on a regular basis? Yes. Cool. How did that, how did you learn to do that? Because, I mean, it yeah. was, again, a, not as long ago as getting me to actually make proper appointments. Okay. But it was still a pretty good bumpy road where it was mostly my mother that helped out with organization and making sure that I took them and nowadays I am doing that all by my own without the organizer or any sort of input from my parents. So it started as very much a shared project but yep. run by mom Yep. and she would get the vitamins that the doctor recommended and she put them in the fill organizer sort of by day and then for two weeks you you would then be responsible for taking the pills at the right time of the day, mm -hmm. 
And then when they're empty, mom will go ahead and refill them for you yep. and start the process over. And then I started filling them and now I'm just taking them straight out of the bottle for daily use. Yeah, so you don't even need the organizer anymore. Nope, I have no idea what she's using the organizer for anyways. They're being stored, yeah. you know, for when I get older and need them. You're already old. Thank you so much, Hunter. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about a health summary and about me. It's important for you to understand your health history. Yep. And for you to be able to talk to your doctors about that. Which is, again, why I love my chart so much, is that they have a direct tab for health summary and everything. And they also have a lot of information about you as well on their website under said health summary that can assist in understanding who you are, medically speaking. Well, beyond medically speaking, though, even. Yeah. So what else? What else is important for the doctor to know about you? Hmm. Well, your general history and everything. Okay. Your health history. Yep. What else? Well, I'm thinking about stuff like um, how you like to make decisions. Like, hmm. Do you want to be able to have other people help you make those decisions, or are you going to make them alone? Right. Um, what your preferences are, like, do you prefer to get shots in your right arm or left arm? Yeah, I'm neutral to those shots. I don't care. So either arm for you. There's some kiddos that it's really important that the doctor knows that before you even try to poke them, they're not going to find a vein, that they've spent 18 years looking for that. So that's information that should be made sure that it's brought forward into the adult healthcare mm -hmm. world, because probably at that point, everybody who knows the kid understands, yeah. but the adult providers are going to be new. And so letting them know these preferences, these likes, these dislikes, what's going to help you to, to make it through the medical appointment, what's going to help you schedule the medical appointment, um, are all important things about you. You know, even your favorite color, what you like to be called, mm -hmm. what yeah. your name is. Because again, you've spent years within one healthcare system and you're moving to a system that may not know all that. Mm -hmm. And so having a place to write down about me about what are my preferences? How do I take pills? For a while, you couldn't swallow pills. No. Nope. But then you learn. Yep. And so do I take my medicine pill? Do I take it as a shot? Do I, you know, how do, you know, how do I eat? So all these things that need to be brought forward mm -hmm. into the adult world um, can be included in an about me. So basically, health and healthcare transition affects every part of our lives. Amen to that. And so it's important that we consider how we transition well. Um, if we are going to sustain employment, if we are going to live as independently as we can, if we're going to go on to high to post-secondary school, um, it could be evolved in the post-secondary transition plan. We talked about how healthcare could be a goal in an individualized education plan. And it ties into the whole fact that this is your life. You know, it's not mine. And so I want you to be as in charge of your life as you possibly can. Yeah. Well, so safely. Yeah, safely. I was about to say that. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about guardianship um, because it is important and it ties directly into healthcare. Because what guardianship is, it's who's going to make the decisions. And so instead of just straight up guardianship, which there could be guardian of the state and guardian of the person, which includes guardian of the person includes the personal and healthcare needs. Um, you don't have to separate guardians, one person could do them both. But it's basically saying that, you know, I am going to care for you, that you don't have the right to care for you. Um, and so we're very cautious about um, automatically jumping to guardianship. We prefer that that people consider um, maybe just a power of attorney for those cases where um, a, a poor decision gets made. Maybe there's a conservatorship, a representative payee, um, and, and a tool called supported decision making, um, which is what we've been talking about. Yep. Is how, you know, wh where do you want me to help you make those decisions? And where do you feel capable of making your own decisions? Do I ever make you make uh, bad decisions? No, I'm the one that usually does that. Yeah, you do. But I don't step in. You have to learn. Yep. 
how to make good decisions and bad decisions. Nobody's going around stopping me from making bad decisions. Well, well, mom. Um, yeah, I was about to say, <laughs> do you want to throw the wife into the equation? No. Oh, so that's a good point. But for the most part, I get to make bad decisions because I'm in charge of my life. Yep. So even though I don't make every decision perfectly, it's no reason why I shouldn't have the right to make those decisions. Correct. So what we've come up, what people have come up with is supported decision making. This is a way to help people with disabilities use that support system that's around them to take control of their lives as, as much as possible. In Wisconsin, it is a legally recognized tool. Um, the youth is in charge of it. The young adult is in charge of it. Um, but it, it's, it, it tries to help build that freedom of decision making um, until eventually you may feel like you got this and you don't need me anymore, which is fine, which is what I want. That's what we want for our kids. Let's be as independent as possible. Yeah, my sister's on a better road of, to that than I am at this point, but she's on a different place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say she's further down the road, but she's she's on sort of a different path there. Well, she has her life in a more organized, centralized manner than I. She has her life in a more organized, centralized manner than I do. Um, it's just she's more organized than we are. Yeah, I blame mom for that. <laughs> and that's again the uh, cloning. Yep. Um, so the board of people with developmental disabilities has some excellent resources on supported decision making that talks about. Um, the different tools that can be used and would really recommend contacting them. And this PowerPoint does have those connections to those resources um, so that you can reach out and figure that out. We also talked a little bit about future planning, about what are your hopes, dreams, and futures is, you know, again, moving from this place where it seems everybody knows you to this adult world, which is sometimes a little bit um, not as cozy. No. And so helping not just healthcare providers, but other family members and people around you know what your hopes, dreams, and visions are, um, such as if the awful thing would happen and I don't want to be here anymore, you would be responsible for letting people know. Yep. Well, what if you're having trouble communicate that? Then I can help you now write down or videotape what your hopes, dreams, and visions are so that if something would happen, you'd still be able to have that information communicated yep. to the people who are supporting you. Yep. Um, so that's, and that also goes with finances, as we talk about finances a lot. Um, the core of it comes down to who is making decisions for you. And we want everybody to make decisions about themselves as much as possible. Yep. Um, there's also some excellent resources on Got Transition, as well as our friends, Family Voices of Wisconsin. Yep. So again, use the handout to get to these websites and look over them yourselves. Yep. And then a lot more stuff on information, on support decision making. Um, a couple things that parents have brought up when we've done this is to consider medical financial coverage. Is if you have Medicaid, you need to be aware that that doesn't automatically transfer over when the youth turns 18. Is they need to apply um, for adult Medicaid um, now. There is a possibility um, if you don't have Medicaid. Your children right now are able to stay on your insurance till 26. It is possible that your child with disabilities may be able to stay on your policy indefinitely. The rules vary from insurance company to insurance company. And so you want to make sure before your child turns 26, if they are just covered by your insurance, if they are on your insurance, um, what the rules are to keep them on your insurance as a disabled child. Um, and I would advise doing that sooner than later. Um, I've done that with Hunter, and they will be sending me paperwork when you're 25 years old. Yeah, and right. see if you qualify. Um, again, Social Security disability and Social Supplemental Security income do not automatically continue. Um, I know this is where a lot of people um, do. They have Social Security as well as Medicaid, and so just be aware that the ADRC is the place to go to help with transferring that into the adult world. Um, can't talk enough about ADRC. Um, they are going to be your, your, your main point of contact. Um, before then, or even with them, is don't forget you can always reach out to the Children and Youth with Special Healthcare Needs Regional Center, and we will make sure that you're pointed in the right direction. 
Um, so we do have some information um, on health and the post-secondary transition plan, a little more information on self-advocacy. Um, one of the things we talk about is disclosure. Who do you tell and when you tell about mm -hmm. your disability? Don't blab it on social media. <laughs> you don't blab it on social media. Do you have to tell everybody every part of your what every part of your health history? No, just the points that can impact your work or your social life and schooling or if it's a very trusted adult like a police officer, firefighter, EMT, um, pastor or whatever denomination of Islam or Judaism you follow or well, religion in general. So you get to make those choices about who you tell what mm -hmm. about yourself. Um, so parents have told us to try to encourage everybody to make a plan, record everything, break things into smaller tasks so it's more manageable, less overwhelming. You don't want to try to do all these things when your youth is 17 and a half, um, but start early. Um, don't see, be surprised if things take longer than you expect, especially during this time of COVID. Yeah, it seems that has slowed everything down. Um, yes. Ask questions of other people involved in your child's life and health um, and get to know other parents. And most of all, be kind and gentle with yourself. Is This is a big change. And it's something that is, is change is, is usually hard. And so be kind and gentle with yourself and know that it's going to be okay, that you and your youth can work through health transition together. And hopefully you can find a trusted partner in healthcare to work with you. Um, so if you feel like you need to do something after this webinar, uh, go ahead and download the readiness assessment from Got Transition and have your youth start working on that. Visit our website, look for our workbook, workbook, and if your youth is still in high school, is talk to your IEP team about how to incorporate healthcare into transition planning. Mm -hmm. um, make sure your primary care doctor understands that you are interested in healthcare transition planning. Um, and that you would like them to talk to your youth about it. Um, find your ADRC, Aging Disability Resource Center, take a deep breath and try to stay a step ahead. Yeah, those are the recommendations from parents. Do you have recommendations, Hunter? Just reach out to other parents that you know that have kids with special needs and everything, no matter what type of needs they are, be it from somebody who is diabetic to a child in a wheelchair. They all have people who they can reach out to, find others to talk to, even if it is just a basic get together from elementary school parent, parents and everything, to high school teachers that you live next to and everything. And what would you say to other youth? Like if you had a chance to talk to a 17 year old, well, you have. I have. <laughs> um, what what would you say to them about their health care? I would say go to your parents, your teachers, and your school nurse, even go to the people that do special ed and everything for those on either speech therapy, um, physical therapy, or just generalized therapy and everything for multiple medical or just personal needs and everything. So use that support network. Yep. Always, always go for a support network. Create a spider web of those you know and trust. Fantastic. Well, that is all we have for you all today. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for listening. We do have some time that we will gladly take questions either through the chat um, or however Bonnie lets us. Okay, so gentlemen, I do have a question actually for the both of you that is probably pretty similar. So if we don't mind, let's start with Hunter first. And Hunter, um, the question is, what was the most difficult part of you beginning to take responsibility and the reins for your health care to you? What was the hardest thing? The hardest thing for me was setting up the appointments and everything because most of the time it was my dad doing everything he was answering the phone going through the questions and just had me for far in the background or not even close to the phone at all 
he was the main one to do the appointments and everything once I slowly started entering teenage years into young adulthood and everything. It was him at the range slowly passing it over to me and with my child's help, I've been able to do it all. Okay, thank you. And for Tim, um, a, the similar question, what was the hardest part of, quote, letting go of this responsibility? <laughs> The hard, oh man, the hardest part is that realization that I can't make him do anything anymore. Is that when he was younger, if I felt he needed to take vitamins or something, then I would find a creative way to make him do it. Is I had a certain amount um, of pull. But now that he's an adult, I have to sit and watch him make some bad decisions sometimes. And we can talk about those decisions, but he gets to make them. Yep. And so it's really hard sometimes um, to see him doing something that I think is, is not the best idea um, or not setting up a doctor appointment when he should, um, staying in pain for longer than he needed to because he didn't feel like making an appointment to be able to not just step in and, and take control over his life, but to let him live his life. Mm -hmm. A lot harder to do that than I thought it would be. Yeah. yeah. Um, there is one other question I think that we have time for, and that's um, e each of you have done a, an excellent job of providing us the information of the give and take of this kind of relationship. Um, is is it necessary in your belief to have like everything written down somewhere like in a notebook or something so you can refer to it or you know is using my chart sufficient or you know beside the digital records are there some kinds of things that you would kind of key in on or you know is a binder idea a good one the secondary notebook and everything or generalized binder for organization would be a excellent tool on top of the digital my chart keeping and everything. Always make sure you keep um, your medical general appointment records separate from your serious, more serious records because I had to take a ride in a ambulance once due to a dislocated knee. And that kicked off the whole, oh my gosh, this thing cost around two grand because it's an ambulance. Those things are expensive, but overall, yes, a notebook, a binder, whatever you wish to use as a secondary organizational tool, it's really needed. I am not one for organization. Proof. Some parents have found what they call a care notebook, and you can Google care notebook. Um, and that's a good way to keep track of the medical stuff. But you also want to have a place to write down and communicate those preferences, those likes, those dislikes. The, you know, we have some some kiddos who just, if if you touch them without asking, it hurts and they're gonna shy away. And so also those nuances of the child is having those those written down so they can get communicated um, is really important. Um, and that's where about me, but you can find a lot of information too on just a care notebook. Um, what's important as we look at transition with care notebook is starting to write down all of the specialists that the kiddo may see, because sometimes they may not see a specialist except for every one or two years. And so it may not be the year that you're seeing them. And so you may forget about them. So making this list of you know, who does he see now? Who does she see now at 15, 16 years old? Why do they see them? Helping the youth understand that as well. But then looking at, okay, what's gonna change at 18? Who's the equal doctor? Is there gonna be an equal doctor? Or is the primary care gonna take care of more of this? Or how is that gonna, trying to figure out how that's going to work before um, the child turns 18 is really important. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you both. Um, do you have any closing statement that you'd like to make? Because we're just right at the time frame here. My only statement is, how many Yetis do you think there were? <laughs> this, 
How many do you think there were? I think there were about 10. Okay. Nine, I, I didn't know 10's a good number. We'll go with 10 yetis. Yeah. Um, <laughs> my, my last statement was, it would just be just take a deep breath and continue on little steps at a time and you're going to get there. Well, thank you both to Tim and to Hunter for a delightful presentation today. I, um, I know that I learned a lot and I'm sure those that are participating have done the same. This will conclude our webinar for today. Thank you all for joining us. Please be reminded that Wisconsin Facets has over 100 scheduled trainings and webinars for the year 2021. Please check out our website calendar and register for any of the upcoming trainings that may be of interest to you. And also please watch for the short evaluation that will be coming your way after the live presentation today. Have a great rest of your day, everybody. Again, thank you, Hunter, and thank you, Tim. Bye, everybody.